thank you. Um, and thanks for that presentation, Grant. That was great. Um, <laughs> so um, academic subversion. Um, this is a really big interest area for me at the moment. Um, sorry, I'm just putting chat and things in the way. Um, because I'm talking to a lot of different staff from across our university about different big ideas that sort of challenge sort of that reserved, quiet academic lens. Um, and I think, you know, the, the relationship between students and staff here is really interesting. So I'll get into that in a second. Uh, Mani Nina Ghana Yata Ana. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting today from the lands of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. I acknowledge those who walked before, elders past and present. The lasting educational spirit of this place remains strong and significant to live in Ghana today. So I hope to continue sharing knowledge and uh, acting with respect in the spirit of reconciliation. Uh, Australia always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I think there's some really uh, interesting and important um, perspectives that uh, Aboriginal cultures bring to the way that we do knowledge sharing as well that I think hopefully play out across this conversation today. So I, I like this, I've been using this quote quite a bit um, in workshops and conversations with people. Um, says you're in the process of being indoctrinated essentially uh, higher education itself has always been a tool um, since it's sort of European origin has always been this tool of reproduction of contemporary culture in a sense and it's been more and less elitist over time but there's been a more um, diverse, massified and open look at the way that we think about and challenge educational practices in recent times, which I think is a really positive turn. But we're also dealing with a lot more top down pressures that have conditioned the way that we think and work. Um, and so this quote to me, in spite of it being quite long, is a really interesting and significant thing to think about. Because once you become aware that your education is just the best of what we know right now from a particular worldview, and it might be privileging and exclusive to particular ways of thinking and to particular people as well, um, we can start to have a more critical lens about what we're immersed in. And what we're immersed in is, and I don't really want to just be really sad for this whole presentation, but um, what we're immersed in is quite um, dire, precarious and problematic. We're in a higher education system, which I would argue and others have argued is losing its purpose, even if we only conceptualize that purpose as a tool of societal reproduction um, for that dominant culture. And so I think we really need to think about, well, how do we challenge the essence of what this higher education is and what it's for? And so in that vein of, you know, as we heard this morning, active student participation, how do we actually create an educational experience for students that's more inclusive, that's more open and actually equip students, not just as job ready graduates, but as active citizens that can have an ongoing impact in the world around them. Continuing in the, the theme of being sad. Um, so we've had, you know, a litany of cuts, restructures, funding changes, and this um, slow uh, installation of uh, middle management class in higher education institutions that's destabilized, quite narcissistic, um, and very interested in their own uh, sort of self-promotion and the status quo effectively. Um, so between this, this middle management now and then senior executive, we've got fewer and fewer people in positions to make decisions that are allies to causes like enhanced democracy, challenging global um, the global status quo, and really looking at those big issues beyond, you know, just is the student going to get a job? Did they meet that outcome? And do they know that particular thing? And so in my conversations with staff, um, this, <laughs> this often comes up students aren't even getting out of bed to come to class. Um, and I think it's really interesting that academics in contemporary higher education are reproducing these narratives, which effectively condition students as um, lazy, um, not interested, uh, and you know, not, not caring or engaging with their education. It's like, why are you not reflecting on what you're delivering in your curriculum and how, how university is working for those students if they're not bothering to come to your classes? Or maybe there's actually something that you could take away from that. I think it's something we don't do enough of is um, sort of wake up to this idea that, you know, it's not just what we um, 
deliver to students, it's actually, it's got to be a conversation. It's got to be more than that. And so, you know, working towards that idea of student agency. So I want to rewind a little bit and um, throw a little bit of Marxian theory at you for a second. Um, so Antonio Gramsci, who was a uh, Italian scholar and theorist who worked um, in the early, so 19 or eight, 1890 to 1925 or so, um, who was imprisoned for most of his life and wrote a lot of his work uh, basically on scraps of paper and then smuggled them out of a prison window, uh, you know, fascist regime in Italy. But he talked about how society was structured, and I think it provides a really useful um, a useful lens to look at the way that we have um, cultural reproduction in higher education systems. So he basically said, let's throw out this sort of lower class, working class, middle class and upper class idea, and let's just have people that have the power to make decisions about society. So basically, you can think of that as the contemporary 1%, people who have the power to govern or manage which includes people like our vice chancellors, um, but also includes, you know, big, big structures um, and increasingly private companies, so CEOs and things like that, that have a lot of say in the way that the world is, is running, um, but don't necessarily need to sort of take a lot from civil society. And civil society is everybody else. So everybody's not in that 1% bracket, people who basically must work in order to um, live their life. And so, this stratification, I think, is really helpful because when we think about the relationship then to education, we can start to see that, you know, when decisions are being made, they're not often, except in, you know, perhaps examples like grants and others from this conference, you know, they're not necessarily being made in consultation and collaboration, and that's really problematic. And so over time, that political society, that sort of dominant group that makes a lot of those decisions have really worked to reinforce that their position in society is a rightful position, that the way that we do things is correct. Uh, and we can see this across all kinds of different narratives um, from you know, colonialism through um, all kinds of systems of control and structure that, that set society up the way that it is. And one of those, of course, is education systems. But I think one of the newer um, emergences in this space has been this deputization. So those um, in positions at the sort of at the top of a pyramid, so to speak, um, are starting to deputize those below them as long as they're playing along with the rules. Uh, and so we're seeing basically less and less agency being permitted in institutions, uh, be that an education institution, be it government or a private company, because the uh, the hierarchy effectively is, is following this sort of same set of rules. But, and to get a little bit more hopeful, what's reproduced isn't fixed. And we've seen really big, you know, over the last hundred years, we've seen really big changes and massive societal transformations. So things like dismantling segregation, women's right to vote, LGBTQI recognition, and so on. There's some really big um, momentous things that have happened um, you know, across lifetimes, but, um, and certainly not easily won, but major cultural changes, which have also rippled into education. And we sort of are only starting to grapple with some of these now, which kind of shows how long it can take for our institutions to catch up with what's happening in popular culture. And I think that's a really interesting thing to think about as well, because if we think about these higher education institutions as these, these sort of fixed structures and very slow moving beasts, we can often be reproducing things that are quite harmful and damaging to you know, our student cohort. And interestingly, in that sense, higher education is quite good at application. So, you know, somebody who has a problem, the institution can sort of hush hush that one particular instance, because actually on mass, it's mostly people who are relatively privileged who have access to higher education institutions. Though, if we think about it historically, um, the 1960s and 70s saw a big massification of higher education in Australia. Uh, and rather than just being about educating lawyers, doctors, and so on, um, the system became more diverse and more open, but at the same time, we saw big activist booms of, you know, students um, protesting, um, you know, wars and all kinds of things that were going on around the world. And so there was this um, almost panic from higher education institutions around this emergence of activism. They, they thought that this was a really bad thing, not a really good thing to show that their education was working and having broad societal change. 
But rather than, and fortunately it was a Labour government at the time, rather than revert back to this model of exclusivity or scarcity, um, the government decided with good intentions, but to tie higher education to employment. And in that way, preventing um, the, the institution sort of being shut down and segregated back to this really small, narrow percentage of people who were then enabled to go on um, to, you know, really specific roles. It remained, you know, diverse, but we kind of lost that activist pathway, except for those um, students who were sort of identified as transitioning into politics. So sort of emergences of um, allyship between the National Union of Students, for example, and the factions of the Labour Party um, as almost a, a channel for students to move straight from a um, student politics position into a, a political position in, you know, state or federal government. And then um, over the sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, we saw this placation of student bodies with um, more menial decisions uh, thrown at them to sort of, you know, make them feel like they were making decisions, but actually taking away a lot of that power that they had previously. And then threatening academics that sided with students to sort of keep that infight between students and staff going rather than having an allyship and a partnership between students and staff, which obviously was slightly problematic. Um, so this quote, uh, this is a quote from a vice chancellor at a university that I attended as a student. He said to me, you're not thinking, you're just being radical when we were talking about um, cuts and transformations to the university. But I actually think that there is a real lesson here for radicalism as a tool for education, progressive education, such that we could leverage, as Larissa talked about this morning, we could actually leverage educational um, patterns and pedagogies such that we could democratize this idea of radicalism so that we can actually empower students to do a lot more. But there are a lot of barriers to that taking place. And I also just want to challenge on that. I want to challenge this idea that higher education creates knowledge, because actually, when we think about coming back to Gramsci's lesson, actually, higher education reproduces knowledges that exist in civil society, um, and we don't create knowledges. We research what's out there through a lens of, you know, we're going to create novel contributions to the field, but actually, we're researching things that are already taking place. And so I think we've got a lot, a long way to go when we think about, you know, production of knowledge. And for a lot of this, it's all in who's telling the story. So um, Bree Lee has a fabulous book about who gets to be smart. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to focus on the second quote here. She says that people think history is carved on a tablet, but it's more akin to chalk on a blackboard. Depending on who is standing at the front of the room, the lines can be rewritten or even erased altogether. And I think that this is really powerful. It's a really powerful provocation both for staff and for students, because actually if we enable students to be the ones that are standing at the front of the room, that are bringing in their perspectives, their lived experience, we can be more contemporary in our learning and teaching processes, and we can address the issues that are of fundamental importance to students, which creates a stronger conduit for them to actually bring in things that matter to them. So rather than, oh, my students won't even get out of bed to come to the tutorial, it's students are anticipating getting out of bed to come to the tutorial because I get to discuss things that are of real importance to me. And then it's the academic's job to work out, well, how has that actually achieved educational values? So it's a flipping of the narrative around, you know, knowledge producers, those that have the power to convey information and so on. So really sort of challenging our sort of status quo again. It's all sounding a bit radical, perhaps. I think it's it's easy to sort of talk about this in a positive and hopeful light of, you know, well, all it takes is, you know, let students have a voice, let them bring in what they think. But actually, we're in a system where these things, these major sort of themes really are playing out quite strongly and really disempowering students and staff. And we're seeing now, I think, particularly in South Australian higher education, um, that education is no longer working as a tool for the transformation of society, but rather is just producing job-ready graduates. 
And so from this frame, I'm really challenged to think of, well, where's the possible? Where is the, um, the more liberatory? Where is the um, more open practices that create human flourishing? You know, we've got all of these things about individualism, um, all, of this, all of this sort of ontological capitalism, as I like to refer to it, that, you know, th makes us think about measurable quantity, reproduction of the same, same old system. But we're not having that opportunity to be hopeful and to really challenge the way that we think about education systems. And I would really like to see more of that. Um, so we're just, you know, really um, positive and happy uh, conversation that I'm having with you today. So um, voluntary student unionism, thank you, Liberal government, um, saw students losing access to those collective action systems. It was a real, um, real, loss of massive progress that had been made across the 60s, 70s and 80s. But to students' credit, they rose again and they continue to rise again and again in new forms of activism that we haven't even thought of yet. Like they're coming up with all these subversive ways of working in our, you know, in our classrooms. They're not coming to class, but they're still passing their courses. It's amazing. So, you know, the ways that students work and think has really changed. And the activism now is not the picket protest of 15 years ago. But we're also seeing things that attempt to placate those kinds of new forms of subversive activism. And I think that's where we need to start to think about ways that we engage students that are more meaningful and more radical and different. So where does this leave us really? And do things like, you know, we want to increase the student voice actually help us move forward or are they empty words? That's a provocation for you to think about. Um, I don't have answers to that, but I think, you know, to me, a lot of the practices that we do have in higher education often are empty language. Can we actually harness those to create social change or to empower students to create social change or not? Um, and then, you know, where do we go from here? Also wanted to touch on onlineification. So this, you know, the movement, you know, during obviously during COVID to mass online education. I think there's a lot of dominant narratives in this space about how it's made students more lazy. They don't learn as much. They're not as interested. There's not as much interaction. And actually, I think, again, we need to challenge our thinking on this because online education is not going away. It's been here for 20 years um, and it's, it's not going anywhere. And so how do we think about building communities of students that can address those big global challenges, that can be more activist? How do we actually harness an online education to do that? I think that's a really important area for our future. So amidst, you know, onlineification, but also amidst all these other narratives of, you know, students don't do the work, they don't show up to class, my students are always cheating, they plagiarise from one another, they're lazy, oh, they're all really disengaged, you know, there is these really pervasive narratives that frame the way that we think about students. And if we take these on as staff, and if students take them on themselves, we do see a complete disengagement. And I think that that's something that we really need to challenge and think about. Because actually, when we think about, again, the provocation from this morning's keynote, and when we think about the student panel from yesterday, there are so many lessons in, you know, coming together for a decolonized, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-ableist um, system of education that uses education as a vehicle for addressing grand global challenges. That's the thing that unifies us. That's the power. And it's like the educational outcomes from that are almost a side benefit because if we can come together and collectively challenge the status quo, the things that aren't working for us, but also move to address these huge societal inequities, massive environmental challenges, all of those kinds of things, that's where we can use education as a real tool for making some kind of social impact. And we can't afford to wait because these things are happening around us right now. It's, it's, you know, it's everywhere. All right, so I'm very sorry for my very cheerful presentation, but I think, in fact, this idea of harnessing an esprit de corps of the aspirant middle-class university narcissist could actually give us one vehicle towards creating meaningful change. So when you see empty, empty buzzwords, figure out ways of, of being subversive and actioning things underneath these new narratives. So I think, you know, for our, uh, our institutions at UniSA, one of the big things that we're working towards at the moment is authentic assessment, um, you know, which again, empty buzzword, but one of the things that 
um, I've sought to do with colleagues is to bring in a student partnership perspective so that students can negotiate what authentic looks like to them in their context. So it's about finding ways to enact decolonized, equity first, egalitarian, open and activist education through these narratives that are introduced about students, about staff and about the way that we come together. And I think it's on all of us, be that student or staff, to work together to really challenge the way that we think about higher education, how we think about the values that we discuss, um, and to actually move education back or maybe for the first time into a space that creates liberatory praxis that's shared between people. Um, and to take the tools of that education back out to the community and diversify it, not an individualistic equipping single students with the capacity to be, you know, politically active, but actually equipping students to be teachers to take their knowledge back to their community and share their learning with their peers and to create something better together. So that's my um, that's my provocation for you, and I'm sorry that it was a bit, um, you know, a little bit negative, but, you know, hopefully that's got you thinking and really happy to um, take any questions or discussion. Thanks so much, Aidan. Um, I didn't think it was depressing. I thought that it was empowering. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Aidan? Manea. Um, I agree with Piper there. I thought uh, very um, provoking questions that are much needed and also in the networks that I've been involved in along the same lines. I consider them facts. It's the reality of what is happening right now within um, both uh, higher ed and the area that we speak a lot about is within the secondary school sector where they are transitioning into higher education and the same issues um, or challenges are present there. So, so what I, the question that I wanted to ask was basically a lot of the discussions we also have is how student voice um, can impact the curriculum. And I wondered if that was something that you had any thoughts on or whether you would like to share anything along those lines, because we felt that that was a really huge um, challenge. <laughs> And education being key, that is something, you know, of course, across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it is a challenge, particularly when we've got, you know, compliance mechanisms and other sort of policy tools that say, you know, the curriculum shall be this and it will work in this way. Um, but I think, you know, the thing for me has been starting small. So, you know, a number of course coordinators that I'm working with um, have begun to do things like negotiate assessment, like a really basic entry level thing, um, but just making small steps towards changing areas of curriculum such that students can bring their perspectives in. And I think in the grander scheme of things to start to move towards a system where um, right from sort of first year, there's, a, there's quite a bit of structure there, but students are invited to bring their lived experience. They're able to negotiate, um, you know, the things that they are interested in and that they can start to have an impact and then, you know, build that across a, a you know, a degree such that by the, you know, third year, fourth year level, students are effectively responsible for curriculum. Um, I don't have an answer to how that looks in policy, but I think it's incredibly possible and I think that, you know, it's somewhere where the sector is moving and it has been done, you know, as we heard from the keynote this morning, it's been done in places like Sweden. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's where we're heading. It just, it is a, it's a challenging road and I think start small and chip away. Cool. Thank you for that. Thank you. Kate, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Thanks, Aidan. I've worked with you. You're much more positive than... <laughs> perhaps you worry about not being if that makes sense um but like I agree I think these are kind of given but um yeah difficult so still incredibly difficult challenges in our institutions um and, we, and I think there are a lot of competing interests that kind of get in the way it's really hard to kind of talk about this agenda of um transformation and civics and citizenship and tackling these big issues out there in the world, a way like that are very much actually not out there. They're very much in here as well in our institutions. Um, when we're worried about like 
job ready graduates and student satisfaction ratings and rankings and all of that kind of thing. So it is hard. Um, my question or sort of something I was thinking about when you're talking was probably what Manea was saying, reflecting on school um, schools. Um, I feel like I'm sort of wondering about how much do our universities, like do we have to worry about this or is there room to be hopeful in the way in which schools now maybe tackle some of this student voice work um, and their focus more on civics and citizenship and we see the, the school sort of protests around climate action and all of that stuff that's going on there that seems to fit a little bit more comfortably or there's space for that because they're seen as sort of probably like controllable but you know all that good on them like harnessing their youthful energy um, why does that suddenly just disappear when we reach university? Um, and do you actually see there's a difference? Yeah, I think, well, that's, that's a really good question, Kate. Um, it, look, I, I don't know what it is that universities are doing that switches those students off or just doesn't, like, just doesn't sort of let them in. Like, there's not a bridge there. Um, and, I, you know, I suspect it's sort of happening in pockets, but it's something that I think you know, we're having a lot of issues sector wide at the moment, um, you know, across all higher education with that an initial attraction rate um, and actually getting students in. And I think that's maybe part of the problem is that we're not connecting with those students who give a shit, frankly, you know, it's like we're not um, lining up, I don't, I don't know, our marketing, but also our practice with the way that, you know, with the things that students care about. And I think that's part of the reason why we've seen that, you know, that narrative of disengagement come up a lot more. Um, and so, yeah, I, and I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is, other than you know, how do we make a higher education system more responsive to actually the big challenges and the current social issues? Because otherwise, we're just going to fade into irrelevance. Yeah, there seems to just be a different focus when suddenly you get to university, and yeah, of course, there's differences. There's the competition of the market. There's a market. Universities exist in more of a marketplace, although schools do too, for sure. Um, but I'm aware of something, if anyone's interested, the Victorian Student Representative Council um, is just as an SRC for all Victorian school students. And I was involved way back in the beginning of that. And it's just gone from strength to strength, working particularly with the Victorian state government. Um, they do incredible work and there doesn't seem to be anywhere in which those students can't get involved. And I think this is secondary school students. This happens in primary schools. Like people can make space for it if they want to. And so we can do that in our institutions too. I really believe that. Thank you so much, Aidan. Thank you.